And then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So they that received the word were saved. The next step, they get baptized. It says, in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 people get saved. They're added. Look at the next verse. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Right? So what, there, what happened? People got saved. Then they joined the church, essentially. Right? They, they got baptized. They continued, it says here, steadfastly in doctrine, fellowship. And that's the title of the sermon today is Steadfast in Doctrine and Fellowship. These are two important aspects of church. And today people have forsaken going to church and people no longer see the importance of, of church. And there's a lot of fake churches out there. But here in the Bible, as we see Acts is like the Wild West of Christianity, right? The disciples, everything was really beginning to blossom after Jesus had finished his ministry and he ascended up and he sent his disciples out with a purpose and to be soul winners. And guess what started happening? Churches were springing up everywhere and the people were known for coming together to be steadfast in the doctrine and in fellowship. And we're going to look at this verse here and we're going to define it. I want you to hold your finger here. We'll be right back. But go to Psalm 78. Psalm chapter 78. First of all, to define the word steadfast, you could say it means to stand fast. There are other verses that use that phrase, standing fast or standing firm. So to be steadfast means you're not backing down. It means you continue to move forward. You're strong in what you believe or in what you're doing. You're sure. So to be steadfast means that you know what you're doing. I mean, you could say that this pulpit or this platform per se is steadfast. It is sure. It's fixed here. It's not going anywhere. Right? And that's kind of what he's saying, that they continued steadfast. They remained strong in the doctrine and the fellowship with the apostles. This is how Jesus started his church. And we've preached about the phrase steadfast or being steadfast a few times here. Obviously on the, the opening day we did. And, and then um, we, we had in Ruth, we talked about how she was steadfastly minded to go. A strategic relocation for spiritual reasons. She said, no, your God is my God. Your people are my people. I'm going with you. I want to be with your God. I want to be with your people, with God's people. We also uh, had a sermon, a steadfast until the end, out of the book of Daniel, about how the characteristics of God, that he was sure and steadfast and is faithful until the end. And that's the type of Christian that we ought to be, even in difficult times, just as Daniel was. Well, here in Psalm 78, we're going to use the Bible as a dictionary, and there's many places it's mentioned. And we're going to start here in verse number 5. Psalm 78, verse 5, the Bible reads, For he established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born who should arise and declare them to their children. He's saying God gave us a law. He said, give it to your children. Your children will arise, give it to their children. This was God's purpose, right? This is why God gave us the word of God. This is why we have the Bible, that one generation would pass it to the next. Look what he says, though, in verse 7, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Our hope is in God. Our salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We should not forget the great works he's done for us. The book was for a, a memorial to remember what God has done. It says, but now that you're saved, hey, you ought to keep his commandments. God's people should be known by keeping his commandments and obeying him because we love him and we fear his judgment. Look at the next verse, verse 8. And might not be as their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. So here we're going to define steadfast by the context and realize by the opposite. So he says, they were stubborn, they were rebellious, they set not their heart aright and their spirit was not steadfast. So stead, what's the opposite of steadfast? To be rebellious. Right? To, to be stubborn in your heart. To not have your heart 
right toward God. So if we're going to be steadfast, we got to have a right heart, a right spirit. We need, we need to not be rebellious. We need to reject the rebellion that comes naturally in the flesh. There's a war in your members. Your flesh wants to go one way, your spirit the other. You want to be right in your spirit, then you got to reject the rebellion that's in your flesh. Skip ahead to verse number 36. Psalm 78, verse 36. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. They lied to God. They said, I believe, oh yeah, we know, oh yeah, yeah. And then what did they do? They did something different. They were wrong in their heart. Go back to Acts chapter 2. So to be steadfast, we need to make sure we're not rebellious. We're not stubborn people. We have to have our heart right and our spirit right. And we need to be steadfast in his covenant. God's covenant has always been conditional. You are saved if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are blessed if you obey his commandments. And if, if you decide not to obey his commandments, guess what? Then God will judge you. God will correct you. He will chastise you. You're in Acts chapter 2. Look back at verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So uh, the question here is, who is this they, right? What is going on in this passage? Who, who is talking to who? What's happening here? Because there are several people involved in this. And I want you to go back to verse number one in this chapter. Acts chapter two, verse number one. Now, you know, I'm gonna tell you that all of the Old Testament feasts and festivals and a lot of the ordinances were really a foreshadowing of Christ to come. Why did they slay a lamb? Well, because the lamb slain from the foundation of the world would come and die for our sins, right? It was a picture of Jesus Christ to come. A lot of the Old Testament, it was full of symbols, symbology, and, you know, a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would do. So, and that's what we see going on here. Look at verse number one. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, the all if we go back a chapter, is going to be the disciples, the ones that were with Jesus, plus some, right? They're in the upper room. But here he says Pentecost. And just for the sake of context, uh, to help you understand what the Pentecost is, you know, in the Old Testament, there were several feasts. There was what was called the Feast of Weeks. And what they did is, uh, after the Passover, Right? They had ordinances. If you remember, they came out of Exodus. They had a Passover. They had the unleavened bread. So then later, they start uh, 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 an order. He says, look, at the beginning of your year, on the 14th day, right? So imagine it's a brand new year. And two weeks in is the Saturday, right? Now their Sabbath was a Saturday. The first day of the week is a Sunday, the same as our calendar today. And they would on that Sabbath, that second Sabbath of the year is when they celebrated sort of like the new year. And they had the Passover where they celebrated what Jesus did for them. The very next day, which in our days terminology would be a Sunday, they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is why we do the Lord's Supper because the Passover was Jesus Christ. The unleavened bread is a, is a different picture. He says that we are the unleavened bread. It says that Christ is our Passover. So you had a, a time that was started essentially from the day of the Passover. You had one day, which that next day was the day of the unleavened bread. And then you had seven sevens. You had seven weeks of seven days that equaled 50 days total. And that's where you get Pentecost. The word Pentecost sim simply means the Feast of Weeks, which is another phrase that we see in the Bible for that. A Feast of Weeks. Well, how many weeks? Seven weeks. So seven weeks by seven days comes up with 49. It didn't start, so it started from the Passover, but you had that one other day. So it was 50 days total. Penta means five. A pentacle is the technical name for an upright star. A pentagram is the sat satanic star where they put a circle around it. So penta just means five. The pentagon has the five sides. So the pentacost, as we see here, was the 50 days from the Passover. There was a lot of people coming in town. There's also significance to the Day of Atonement. In the Bible, it also it gave them a notice of a year of Jubilee. 
right? Just as in creation, when he begins explaining all of the feast days, every time the first thing he says is what we see back in Genesis 1, on the seventh day God rested. On the seventh day, you should rest. And what's he saying? Hey, rest from your works. You can't be saved by your works. Again, even that is a picture. Creation is a picture of what Jesus did for us. So you had that seventh day. Well, in the same way, they say, well, on that seventh year is a jubilee year. What does that mean? If you have an indentured servant, you have somebody that was sold into debt and they're working for you, on that seventh year, you got to set them free. That seventh year, you would return possessions to people. Well, then the seven times seven, they had what was called the Day of Atonement, the year of Jubilee. It was the 50th year. So if, if Brother Dale sold me his family's property, my family would have to give it back to him free of charge 50 years later on that 50th year. So that's what the year of Jubilee, it's setting things free. You know, Jesus came to set the captives free. So all of that is symbology. And so what happened was it started on the 14th day of the month, right? Two weeks in. It, then the next day was the day of unleavened bread, which is a picture of what we are. We're actually called that in the Bible. And it says in 1 Corinthians 5, actually, let me read. It says, purge out the old leaven. Now, leaven often represents sin. He says that ye may new, be a new lump as ye are unleavened. Hey, once you're saved, you're that unleavened bread. It says, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The Passover lamb was Jesus Christ. We are unleavened now. We're without sin. We're, we're purged of our sin. Now he's saying, now that you're saved, continue to purge out that sin. Get that sin out of your life. Now it's your choice on a day-by-day -day basis. So in John chapter 20, it says, when Je it says that Jesus, at the first day of the evening, being the first day of the week, he sent his disciples out. He said, the same way that he sent me, even so I send you. He breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. So here at the Pentecost, this is not the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. This is an important fact. In Acts chapter 2, this is the Holy Ghost falling upon them. As we see in the Old Testament, King Saul, he was a man of God. He was already saved. And then God's Spirit fell upon Saul, and he prophesied mightily. And they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Right? King David had the Spirit of God on him. King David was also a prophet of God. He prophesied, he preached, but then when he fell with Bathsheba, Psalm 51, he says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He's not saying I can lose my salvation. He's saying, hey, keep prophesying through me. I want your blessing on my life. I want to be filled with your Spirit. So what's happening in Acts chapter 2 is they are filled with God's Spirit. The disciples here were saved. In Acts chapter 20, or John 20, verse 21, Jesus gave them the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So that's an important fact that this is not where they receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. A lot of Pentecostals like to teach that, but they have a strange doctrine. They have a strange salvation. So the, uh, the, the year of Jubilee is a picture of Christ. The Sabbath is a picture of Christ. Also, the Pentecost is a picture of Christ. So what do we see? Look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being a... Oh, let me stop right there. So being seen of them forty days. So what happened? The, the Passover happened. Right? The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He resurrected, right? So Jesus was killed. He was our Passover, the foreshadowing of what was to come. Fifty days later is what we're reading about at the day of Pentecost. And yet Jesus tarried with them for 40 days. So he was on the earth 40 days after his resurrection. Look at the next verse. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, ye have heard of me. So he said, hey, there's something else coming. There's a promise coming. There's a miracle going to happen. It's going to be manifest unto everybody. This was foretold in the Old Testament. Now go to chapter 2 and look at verse number 5. So the first group of people we saw in chapter 2 were the disciples. The ones that Jesus said, wait here, something's going to happen. The second group we see are the people that are coming in for the Feast of Weeks, for the Pentecost. Look at verse number five. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. So these people were saved under the Old Covenant. They had not yet heard of the New Covenant, 
right? The disciples had the Holy Spirit. They were saved under the new covenant. They were coming back to Jerusalem for that feast of weeks, that 50th day from the Passover. They're coming to keep that. They're devout men. They're seeking the Lord. They're trying to obey the Lord. They're looking for God's blessing. So in verse 1, we had the disciples that walked with Jesus, that were given the great commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, then here comes men from every nation that were already Jews, they were already devout, and here's, and here's how it all comes together. They're coming to Jerusalem. Now look at verse number 13. Acts chapter 2, verse number 13. Here's our third group. Others, mocking, said, these men are full of new wine. Now, so the, the miracle begins to happen. Men were speaking with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit worked through them. People were hearing different languages. So here come the Pharisees. Here come the, old, the, the, the unsaved Jews that lived in Jerusalem that saw Jesus and rejected Jesus. And what do they do? They come in mocking. Right here comes the Pharisees crowd. Look, so we got three groups now. The people from out of town, the disciples, and the people that lived in Jerusalem that were unsaved. Look at verse number 16. So the disciples begin to preach. They say in verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now in Joel, when he's talking about the pouring out of the Spirit, again, this is God's Spirit falling upon them, but this was so miraculous because normally you probably didn't see hundreds of people preaching at the same time in the power and the Spirit of God. But they were all indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And we as New Testament believers, we have that power of the Holy Spirit in us. When we submit to God's will and we're used of God, we can prophesy mightily the Scriptures, the power of God, and we can do it through God's Holy Spirit. This was the purpose of the Holy Spirit. This was the foretelling of how it would come. And he used this event to just let everybody know that something had changed, that things were changing. Look at verse number 18. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now look, it doesn't say of all the Jews. It doesn't say of all them in Jerusalem. It's of my servants. So these are the disciples that were saved. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were indwelled with the Holy Spirit, eternally secure. These New Testament disciples began preaching, men and women alike were preaching the gospel to the multitude that had come back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks. Look at verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Now we know according to Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, that this is referring to the end times, the end of the world, the rapture, the resurrection, right? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that part of it is still yet to be fulfilled. The moon did not turn into blood that day, but it was a beginning. They said, hey, what was spoken of in Joel has began. This is the last days. Since Jesus come, it is the last days. Look at the next verse, 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look, salvation has always been the same. We see that calling on the name of the Lord in Genesis chapter 4. We see it in Joel. We see it here in Acts chapter 2. And a lot of people that don't understand Acts 2, they ignore this verse. And they, they point to verse 38 and they say, well, you have to repent and be baptized to be saved. You have to do the works. You have to be dunked underwater. You've got to speak in tongues to be saved. That is a lie. Look, this is salvation. If you call upon the name of the Lord, believing that He saves you, understanding that He's God, that He is your Savior, He saves you from the punishment of your sins, you will be saved. It says, whosoever, that's the promise. It's always been. But this other group, those that were mocking, they, they were Jews in name only, right? They were children of the devil, Jesus said. They had a different gospel. They were trying to keep the works to be saved. They were preventing people from entering into the kingdom of God. And they didn't believe that. They didn't believe whosoever. They say, oh, no, no, you've got to be a, a scribe or a Pharisee. You've got to be a Sadducee. You've got to do it our way. You've got to do the works. We need to see your works so you can be saved. But that is never what the Bible has taught. It has always been by faith alone. 
And so these people are warned about here. Look at verse number 21. So he points his guns on these guys. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves know, right? These are the Jerusalemites. They're not the disciples. They're not the, pen, the, the, the men that came from every nation. These are the unsaved Jews. So imagine this crowd. Imagine they're preaching what's going on, the miracle, the sign from God, and then God, Jesus' disciples, they turn to the enemy, and they start to rebuke the enemy. Now those from every nation that were watching, the devout men, they were probably amazed, like, whoa, they're yelling at the Pharisees? They're yelling at the religious leaders, telling them they're wrong. Look at the next verse. Verse 23. Him being delivered by determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified him. He said, your judge had already determined you were going to convict him guilty. Your determinate counsel, your wicked heart, your wicked hands, you killed the Lord Jesus Christ. He begins to point the guns on him. This is the Savior of the world, and you wicked wannabe Jews killed him. Right? So the, the disciples are on the attack. Look at the next verse, 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Right, so here they begin now to preach the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They begin to go through and preach the gospel. And, and hey, they're preaching to the wicked people. They're preaching to the strangers in the crowd, the devout men. The disciples are doing their job that Jesus tasked them with. Look at verse number 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Look, Jesus died and went to hell for your sins, so we can all be forgiven of our sins, so we can all be saved. This is the message they're preaching to the multitude. So the devout men, they get it. They want it. They're looking for the Christ. The Pharisees, they still didn't want it. They were in the same way before the preaching. The preaching didn't change them, but the preaching got the devout men saved. Now look at verse 39. For the promise is unto you and your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Right? Whosoever believeth in him. Right? Whosoever believes, you will not perish. You can be saved. And he's saying it's to everyone. It's not just to you. It's not just to this city. It's not just to this tribe or this nation. It's to everyone. And he's talking to the people that came from afar off. And he's saying it's to you and your children and those that are afar off. These same people would later leave Jerusalem with the gospel, with that message, and go out into the whole world preaching and getting others saved. And he says it's for everybody. Look at verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So here, the devout men, the disciples are saying, Hey, devout men, look out for these Pharisees. Watch out for this untoward generation, this generation of vipers, these wicked Jews that by their religion are deceiving people. They're not getting people saved. They're trying to tell people that Jesus was not the Messiah. He's saying, save yourself from this generation. Look out for these people. Be warned of them. Look at verse 41. Because by the way, the Jews were racist. They were racist. Well, only our race is good. Our tribes, our people. No, and, and they were a mingled people already. And, and listen, they fell away because of unbelief. If they didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't care what your bloodline is, I don't care what your religion is, I don't care what your tribe is, you're not going to heaven. You will not be with God. You will not, you're not in the family of God. Verse number 40, look at this, I'm at 41. And then they, that's the devout men, then they that gladly received his word, they got saved, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Then they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. So 3,000 of these de devout men that had come from every nation to Jerusalem, they got saved, they got baptized, and they continued steadfastly. They stayed around and learned the doctrine. They were added to the church. Go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. 
So this is the beginning of the New Testament church as we know it, which there was a church in the wilderness. There were saved people before the church. But this is how God really began to start things off. And what did this first church do? What did this early New Testament church do? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Step one, right? They're saved. They get baptized. They themselves became a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. They humbled themselves to learn from a man. To say, well, you know what? I don't know everything. I don't have it all figured out. And, and the devil wants to use pride and say, well, I know my Bible pretty good. What do I need a pastor for? What do I need some preacher for? Why should I listen to somebody else? I got it all figured out. The Bible says that God gives every man a minister. God gives you people to learn from. If you are so foolish to say, I've got it all figured out, I can't learn from somebody else, well, then you're not going to learn. You're not going to grow. You're going to be stuck where you're at. And, and you need to humble yourself just as I do and have to other men, just as Pastor Romero did to other men and say, hey, I'm here to learn from you. Hey, I'm here to learn from the disciples so I too can be a disciple. So I too can send out other disciples. That's God's plan. That's his method. And look, we have to beware of these internet false prophets, these self-proclaimed prophets with strange doctrine. You know, we've seen several of them pop up where they... they well, I'm going to disable comments so you can't make fun of me for believing a hollow earth or, you know, or, oh, I don't believe that every Christian will actually get to heaven. I think they have to go to hell for a little while. So I'll just disable the comments. Yeah, you know, that's usually a, a warning flag. There was that other false prophet that was, wasn't qualified in Tennessee. He did the same thing. We started disabling comments. I don't want to see, I don't want to take any flack. I don't want your comments. I don't want somebody to expose me. So I'll disable all my comments. All right, look, the internet is full of foolish doctrine. It's not the doctrine we get from the Bible. The internet wants to convince you that angels mate with animals and humans and all sorts of silly stuff, that the earth is billions and billions of years old, that science falsely so called. Yeah. Hey, look, I rest in the Bible. The things I don't understand, I take it on faith. What I do understand is very clear, very simple, very, I mean, it's so easy to comprehend a child can understand it, but yet these internet false prophets, they're, they're going to come up with some new way. Well, I've got a special doctrine. Nobody else sees it like I do. Okay, Peter Ruckman. Right? Well, oh, there's like six different ways to get saved in the book of Acts. Okay, you're a liar. You're not saved. In right. the same way, today we have people that they call themselves a Christian. They start a YouTube channel. They start a Facebook page. They start a blog or a newspaper. And what do they do? Well, I don't, I don't really believe in this part, but I like this page. And I don't believe in that part. I see I got my own way. My, my view of the rapture isn't, is like nobody else's. Okay, then you're in error. You're wrong. You, you're teaching something that's strange doctrine. It's not sound doctrine. And so they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Notice they didn't come in and say, well, we're already devout men. What can we learn from you? In fact, let us teach you something. Let me show you how I like to do it. No, they humbled themselves. They sat at the disciples' feet and they said, teach us what Jesus taught you. I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to correct my error. I don't want to be like that untoward generation. I don't want to be an unsaved Jew like them. I want to go from being a Jew to becoming a Christian. I want to be like Christ. I want to know his doctrine. I want to do things his way. Now look at John chapter 7 where you're at. Find verse number 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Wait a minute, what Bible college did you go to? Jesus, did you go to Bob Jones or Pensacola Christian? South, where did you go? You haven't studied under our religious doctorates. How dare you come and teach something? You never received letters. How, how dare you? Look how Jesus answers them. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine but his that sent me. Jesus said, hey, this isn't my doctrine. This is the Father's doctrine. This is the doctrine of God. He sent me to teach it, and they didn't want it. Well, it was contrary to what the Jews believed, but yet there were people getting saved. He went into the, the synagogue preaching and teaching, and people were getting saved, and they had ruffled their feathers. They couldn't stand it. They were ready to put him to death. Look at verse uh, 17. If any man will do his will, the Father's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. Now Jesus is telling us about his ministry, but there's a rule of thumb in this verse that applies to all of us. Say somebody, hey man, you got to watch this video. Check this guy out. He's got some pretty interesting stuff about, you know, the, the, the origin of the Bible or creation. Or he's got some new way to look at this or that, you know. Maybe we've been looking, look at this guy. Well, 
God gives us his spirit to discern these things, right? The Holy Spirit of truth lives and abides in us to lead us and guide us into all truth. He'll reveal things to us. He'll show us things to come. And so Jesus is saying, here's a rule of thumb. He says, if any man do his will, if you're saved and you're trying to live for God, right? That doesn't mean you're sinless perfection, but you're trying to be in God's will. You're trying to do things right. You're trying to obey his commandments. He says, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Listen, Christian, if you're strong in the Spirit, you're powerful in the Word, you're obeying God by reading and studying, then guess what? When somebody throws some strange doctrine at you, you're not going to be duped. You're not going to be deceived. Even if you don't have an answer right away, something's not right. What this guy is saying doesn't make sense. I can't put my finger on it, but my Spirit's not receiving it. God's giving us a, a litmus test, right? Hey, be in the will of God, and we will be able to judge whether the doctrine is of God. Wait a minute, angels? Mating with animals? This sounds like Greek mythology written by a bunch of homos, pedophiles, perverts, faggots. Wait a minute, this isn't of God. Wait, I don't see that clearly stated in the Bible. You know, there's this post pre-tribber that keeps spamming our church and saying, oh, hey, I got questions. I'll answer this, answer that. I say, hey, here, here's a question for you. Give me one verse that says it's before the tribulation. Or shut your mouth. It's after the tribulation is what the Bible says. And, and either take it or not. And this guy, oh, no, I got some other way. Okay, yeah, well, you can go read the scholars and quote Spurgeon and all this, but I'm not going to receive that. That doctrine is not from my father. Look what he says in the next verse here, verse number 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory, that sent him, the same is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. Listen, the Bible says there are many false prophets gone out in the world. There is a spirit of antichrist. We're commanded to try the spirits. And how do we do it? Is it of God? Do they confess Jesus Christ? And when people come to you seeking their own glory, well, we're trying to build this big old, yeah, you watch this guy. Well, you know, I've got my special way. If you buy my reference Bible, oh, okay. Well, here's another guy, this a big Nephilim guy, Trey Smith on the internet. I don't know if you guys have seen this guy. And it's like, well, I, I came out of this false prophet movement and I got it all figured out. Okay, well, what do you have to do to be saved? Oh, buy my book. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? So you've got, you've got the secret information for thousands of years about how angels mated with animals, but you can't tell me how to get saved? Okay, you're not of my father. You are not of God. There are people that are wicked that are trying to deceive people and dupe people. And there's all sorts of strange doctrine and false prophets out there. You know, I've got a new revelation. You know, if anybody says, well, I'm the only one. Whoa, red flag. Be warned. Beware. Be careful. Look, and, and don't get me wrong. If you're reading and studying your Bible, you will find nuggets. You will discover secrets. You're like, whoa, this verse connects with that verse. And it happens all the time. Just hang out after the service. You'll have men saying, look what I found this week. Check it. Hey, I got a question. You ever seen this? Everybody else goes, whoa, that's cool. Right? Hey, that's why fellowship and doctrine is important in the church. We share things. We grow together. You know, the, I, I'll use the phrase, but I don't mean it as the world uses it. We have a collective consciousness. Right? The Lord gives me a message. I see it in the Bible. It's what God says. I share it with you. And guess what? You see it as well. You say, yeah, that's what God says. I believe it. Yeah, that's what we need to do. I see it. I believe it. We're all on the same page now. We're in unity is a biblical term. Look at how they answer here. Look at verse number 19, how Jesus, again, he points his guns at him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? Right? So Jesus, knowing their thoughts and their heart, he knew what was really going on. Well, how did they attack him? You have a devil. Now look, the Bible calls that blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Mark chapter 3 says that they have no forgiveness. It's eternal judgment. Why? Because they said that Jesus had a devil. Specifically says they said he had an unclean spirit, it says in Mark chapter 3. So here, that's exactly what they did. Thou hast the devil. What's that tell you about these people? They're already reprobate. They're already sons of the devil attacking. And, G and he's, hey, you don't even keep the law. You, you know, Go to uh, verse 24. John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We need to like write this one down. You need to memorize this one. This one is a very easy one to memorize. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous appearance. Well, I saw a guy yesterday. We're out soul winning. Brother TJ can testify. 
I mean, he's smoking, he's burly, he's got tattoos. Oh, well, that guy, I mean, he doesn't want God. And he was the most excited guy I talked about. He said, man, I've been trying to figure it out. I've been talking with my neighbor about, is it really everlasting? I mean, what a blessing to talk with this guy and share some doctrine with this guy. Now, if I did what most Baptists do and judge by appearance, well, he doesn't have a suit and a tie on. What's he doing on Saturday, staying on the side of the street, smoke? Oh, man, this guy's, hey, come on. Look, as Christians, we need to follow Jesus' pattern, and we need to try to judge righteously. We need to judge by the words that come out of the heart, not by appearance. Because the doctrine of the Pharisees was called leaven. Jesus said it's leaven. What does that mean? It's sin. How? Their doctrine was, well, look at me. I fast twice a week. I give all that I have. I obey every law. No, you don't. Jesus called them out. No, you don't. You're a liar. He said you don't even keep the commandments. Turn to John chapter 18. Jesus warned about these false prophets bringing in contrary doctrine. The doctrine of devils is what the Bible calls it. And what do they want to do? They want to say, let me see your works. This guy I'm talking about, <laughs> Brother TJ, he says, oh, I go to that West Side Baptist Church. Oh, okay, the one that says you have to repent of all your sins to be saved on their website. That's literally what it says. Okay, well, I know where he's at, and I know why he's struggling. Because of the false doctrine he's being taught. Because all they want to do is keep him feeling sorry Keep on coming back, brother. Just keep on giving. Help us build that next big building, you know, and maybe God will use you. Maybe God will accept you. Look, they keep people in limbo and in confusion for their own financial gain, and it's wicked as hell. And, and that's the doctrine of the Pharisees. It's called leaven. It's strange doctrine. It's not sound doctrine. And we get sound doctrine. It comes from God. He gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to his disciples. And his disciples give it to the next, and the next, and the next. And that's how we get it. That's the biblical pattern. Look at verse eight, uh, 19, John 18, 19. This is Jesus on trial. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine, right? What have you been teaching and who are you hanging out with, right? Can you imagine if they arrested me? Oh, we heard you were preaching hate speech. You said that not everybody gets to go to heaven. That's hate speech. <laughs> Tell us who you're hanging out with. Well, you know what? Look how Jesus answered this. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. It's open. It's public. His disciples had the same doctrine because they were sitting there listening to it. Look, if, 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 if the government wants to, the, the Jews want to send some agent in here to sneak in here and see what we teach, they're wasting their time. Watch the live stream. Everything we believe is going to be taught across this pulpit. When we have to do things as a church, we're going to do it openly and publicly. We're going to shed light on it. All the old churches, they cover things up. The old Baptists, the old Catholics, what do they want to do? Uh-oh, we got a pervert in our midst. Well, let's, let's not tell anybody. Let's hide it. Let's disguise it. Let's pay somebody off. Let's get some hush money. And let's move him to another place so we can molest more children. Look, that's wicked as hell. Yeah, yeah. Everything should be open and public. That's how Jesus' ministry was. He called out the false prophets openly. He rebuked his own disciples openly when there was time for it. He taught his disciples openly and in public. That's the biblical. How do we get this doctrine? You come to church. You hear what's preached. Well, what do you, what do you believe that you're not telling us? I don't know. What have I not covered yet? We'll get to it next week. Is there something we haven't covered? We'll preach about it. Because everything that God teaches us should be preached openly and publicly. We have nothing to hide here. Look at verse 21. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What have I said unto them? Behold, they know what I said. He said, why are you asking me? Why don't you ask them that are putting me on trial? Why don't you ask my disciples? Why don't you ask everybody? Everybody's heard what I had to say. Why are you putting me on trial? Right? He used the Fifth Amendment, if you will, to defend himself because he had, he had already said it and said it and said it. And then they're like, oh, let's go, let's go see if we can call, catch him calling himself a king. Right? Oh, he's trying to do a political overthrow. Look at John chapter 20. Flip ahead. John chapter 20. Find verse number 19. After the resurrection, verse number 19, it says, Then the same day, right, the same day he rose from the grave, being the first day of the week. Well, Brother Fannin, how come you guys meet on Sunday? Aren't you guys Sabbath keepers? Well, no, Christ is our Sabbath. He's our Passover. He's fulfilled those ordinances. Why do we meet on Sunday? Oh, is it? You get that from the Catholics. No, I get this from Jesus Christ. I get it from the Apostle Paul. I get it from the book of John, the book of Acts. It says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, 
where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were his disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. What is Jesus doing? The pattern he was taught, right? Jesus said, I'm not speaking of myself, I'm speaking of the Father. And yet I'm going to give you another comforter, and he will not speak of himself, he'll speak of me. When we go out knocking doors, if your gospel presentation is, well, let me tell you how wicked of a person I used to be, and I turned from all my sin, you're speaking of yourself. You're not abiding by the way that we're supposed to be saying. You're, if that's your gospel, you're not saved. You're trusting in your works. What is our gospel? Hey, let me tell you what Jesus did for you. Let me prove to you from the scriptures that he is God, that he's your savior, that he's the only way to heaven, and without him, you will go to hell. That's the gospel. That's what we're called to do. So he sent them in the same way, with the same doctrine, with the same power of the Holy Spirit. Look at the next verse. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is the indwelling. God's Spirit is always with us. Right? We have everlasting life from the moment we believe. Now that we're in the New Testament, the cardinal ordinances are done away with. That picture has come. Jesus is here. We have God's Spirit dwelling in us. Yeah. We as Christians need to obey where that Spirit leads us unless we grieve it. Then we get in trouble. Then we get corrected by God. He's given us power in the Holy Spirit. Jesus was given the power of the Holy Spirit by the Father to preach with boldness. He sends his disciples in that same power. Look at the next verse, verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. He says, go and preach forgiveness. This is salvation doctrine. How, how did they continue steadfastly in the doctrine? They just repeated what they were taught. The same method they got saved is what they shared with somebody else. Oh, well, this is a Jehovah's Witness. Maybe they need something special. No, they need the same doctrine. They have to believe the same points, the same thing. Oh, well, these are the Hasidic Jews. Maybe they need something special. No, they need the same gospel, the same doctrine that Jesus taught, that he taught his disciples. Look at verse... Go, go back to, actually go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. So Jesus sent them in the power of the Holy Spirit to save souls, to preach doctrine. In Acts 2 where we started, remember it said, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Is the next thing he says there. And fellow, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' fellowship. They were hanging out with the apostles. Guess what? You can't get that on the internet. You can't get fellowship sitting at home. There are people that live 15 minutes from here that have visited here that have never come back. Well, I watch all the time. I watch Pastor Anderson. I watch Pastor Jimenez. Cool, great. I want to be a soul winner. Great. Where are you going to church? Oh, that lame 1122 where they preach a false gospel. Why? Well, I'm looking for a wife. You're looking for a liberal wife, an unsaved wife, because that's all you're going to find over there, right? Well, I, you know, we're going to come. I want to be a soul winner. We're going to come. Okay, don't forswear yourself. Never been back. Never been back. Look, they're not going to grow as a Christian when they refuse to have fellowship. Yeah. They're, they're rejecting their own growth. In Acts chapter 4, he said, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. You want to know how to be bold in your soul winning and in your preaching? Start as a silent partner. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Come with me and see how God gives me His Spirit and boldness. My confidence is in the Word. And I don't care what kind of a curveball or a doctrinal question you throw at me. I got the answer book. And I got the Spirit that will lead me and guide me into all truth. You want to grow in your confidence and your boldness? Get out there. Have some fellowship with a fellow disciple. Fellowship emboldens you for Christ. And look, you must stop fellowshipping with the wicked people, with the old friends, with the world. you got to change your friends and you can change your life. 
This is one thing I promise you. If you keep doing the same thing and hanging out with the same people, you're going to get the same results, which is not boldness. It's not doctrine. It's not spiritual power. If you want spiritual power, you need to hit the reset button. You need to find your, okay, navigate, get that phone out, say, uh, Steadfast Baptist Church. Boop. Right? <laughs> I need some doctrine. Lord, help me. <laughs> we have to hang out together to help each other. You, can, there, you can't learn the, the nuts and bolts. There's only so much I can teach in an hour. There's only so much you can learn by listening for an hour. There are people that have listened to Pastor Anderson for years, and yet they're still not growing in certain areas because they're not doing. Don't just be a hearer only, an online hearer. Be a doer of the work. Doer of the word. Obey what it says. Put it into application. And it starts by changing your friends. If you just go and hang, oh, I'm going down to smoke some weed and shoot some pool. I'm saved. I'm not going to lose my salvation, but I'm going to hang out with those friends. Guess what you're not going to do? Grow as a Christian. Yeah. Grow as a disciple. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to copy their habits instead of our habits. Look, we're not perfect. And that's part of discipleship as you figure out, hey, these people are all messed up just like me. This is great. Right? <laughs> Look in the mirror. I mean, if any of you say you're perfect, <laughs> oh man, how am I going to hang out at this church? All these people are so great. No, we're not. We're average people. We love the Lord. We want to grow. And we're, we're doing it together. That's the purpose of the church and a fellowship. But if you're hanging out with the old friends, well, it's my family, and they, they still do this, and they want to drink. And it's, I mean, you know, I tell them I don't approve of it, but I still hang out with them. Woe unto you. What are you teaching your children? Hypocrisy. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says, But I say the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Well, I just like going down and hearing that band. I'm just going to go to the club. You're having fellowship with devils. Amen. You think that makes God happy? No. no, it doesn't. 2 Corinthians 6, he says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness. What is unequally yoked? A yoke is that wood they would put from two, two cattle, right? And they're supposed to, well, we don't want to put a calf and a big old daddy cow. We want to get the same type of cow. That way, they're not unequally yoked. Can you imagine having that, can you imagine putting the same burden? Like, okay, we're going to grab some weights. I'm going to get my two-year-old. She's going to get the other end of the bar and it's 200 pounds, and I got this end, well, how come she's not lifting her side? Hey, we're unequally yoked. Now, apply that spiritually. Apply that spiritually. What's happening if you're hanging out with somebody that's in darkness, that's unsaved? They're pulling you down. People do one of two things. They either lift you up and encourage you, or they drag you down and they discourage you. If you're hanging out with somebody that's unsaved, and your joy is, man, I just read this Proverbs this morning. Man, I'm studying this verse. I'm trying to memorize it. Man, I figured out this new doctrine. I want to share it. And you give it to them, and they don't care. What does that have to do with me? I don't want that. Look, that's being unequally yoked. It's not going to encourage you in your spiritual growth. Ephesians 5, he says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Have no fellowship with their... Why is it unfruitful? Listen, he, he war and the things that you did in the flesh, was it fruitful? Is there anything you've given in in sin in the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, that was fruitful, that was profitable unto you? No. no. And he's saying, don't, that is unprofitable, that's dragging you down. Don't have fellowship with it. Yeah, but hey, buddy, where you been? We missed you. Come on back. We saved your seat. I got something special for you. No, I'm going to reprove you. I want nothing to do with that. If I did that before, I was in error, and now I'm going to live for God. Now I'm going to have fellowship with light, with righteousness, with saved people. Preach to your old friends. Look, you're in Hebrews chapter 10. Find verse number 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised us. All right, we will waver in the flesh. Life is a roller coaster. What he's saying, though, is we understand this doctrine. Hold on to it. Stand fast on it. Hold firm to what you have and don't waver. Well, I know watching TV is a sin, but I just, I'll just turn it off this week. I'll put it in the closet, and we might get back to it later. No, that's not holding fast. 
All right, that's wavering. That's back and forth. There are things God wants you to do in your life. If you're willing to do it, God will bless you. Hold fast to it. Verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. This is one of my most favorite verses in the Bible. Let me consider you. Let me think about you. Let me be trying to help you. How? To provoke you unto love, to provoke you unto good works. How do I provoke you unto love? Hey man, don't have that attitude. Hey, why don't you come soul winning with me? How do I provoke you unto good works? Hey, you really need to get back in church. We missed you. Right? We are to provoke you. Consider one another to provoke. And we know the word provoke is often used in a, like, don't provoke them to anger. Don't provoke a fight. Can you imagine if I got up in your chest and I'm like, where have you been? You better get in church. Uh, it's good to see you, but God's going to bless you if you stay in church. Think about it. To provoke one another, considering one another unto love and unto good works. We need to help each other grow. We need to help each other. That's the goal of Christianity. That's the purpose of fellowship. Look at 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Look, man, we're in the end times. Have you seen what's on the news? Quit hanging out and just come out of church. You know, uh, well, I'm, I'm on this Google chat and we have church online. No, you don't. That's not church. All right? Church is physical. It's face to face. And it's growing together. It's helping each other. It's considering one another. And it's, it's something that he says, consider one another. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. There are a bunch of Christians. They are truly saved. We will see them in heaven and we'll never see them in church. It's their loss. Well, it's somebody we would love to help. If they walk through the door, hey, welcome. Welcome back. Is this your first? Hey, we want to help you. We want to love you. We want to help you grow. We want to grow together. You know, you can't learn doctrine just by watching. You can't learn the doctrine of the disciples just by sitting on the sidelines. You can't get all this stuff from the internet alone. You need to be here. If you want to be a better dad, you want to be a better husband, get your butt in church. Learn how other people are doing it. Watch other people. Watch the dads that are doing a good job, that have a bunch of kids. Watch the moms. Mom, ladies, you want to be a better lady of God? You want to be a better wife, a better mom? Come to church. Have some fellowship. Watch what's going on. See how other people are doing it. There's a friend of ours. My heart goes out to them, and they don't have this. They're somewhere else. They're out in the desert, spiritually speaking. They don't have a church where they can grow from other people. They, they are jealous of what we have in our church. I wish I could be there with the other ladies. I wish I had a coffee hour. I wish I had other moms to share me their little secrets of diapers and all these other mom stuff. right? I, and that's what ladies need, that sort of thing. Ladies got to have the fellowship. Yeah. Men, we're, we're a little rougher than that, you know? That's why when dad gets home, how was your day? Good. <laughs> right? <laughs> Mom goes to the store for 30 minutes and comes back. And I mean, she talk, tells you about it for 45 minutes. That's okay. That's how we're, God made us different, right? That's good. And consider that, that the ladies are considering one another. The ladies in here, they need to fellowship with one another. They need to make themselves get out of their hole and go out and see some friends. They need to make themselves have new friends. Look at... Uh, Look at verse 28 here. All right, let me back up. Hold on. We're on uh, 26. It says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now this is a verse that's often twisted or misused, and it's talking in context about people in church. Right? It's saying get in church. Be around God's people. If you're around God's people, it'll help you see that you're not perfect. You are gonna, you're going to sin. You're going to mess up. But we also have the need to stop sinning. There's that need, that desire to stop sinning and get better as a Christian. So he says, if we sin willfully after. If you sin after you're, you get saved, you don't go back down to the altar and, and slay a lamb. Right? Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he was slain once. Verse 27, it says, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. What's he saying? Hey, if you break the law intentionally after being, after being saved, you will be judged. You will be corrected. In the Old Testament, it called it a presumptuous sin. The warning was, hey, you're a child of God, you do a presumptuous sin, you die the death. All right? In the Old Testament, they put people to death for adultery. If somebody that was saved 
committed adultery, their body died, their soul went to hell, um, to heaven, right? They didn't lose their salvation, as people like to twist this verse and try to say it means. What it's saying is, there's correction going to come. Why do we come together? Why do we assemble ourselves together? To be warned, so that we hear and fear, so that we abide by God's rules. Hey, 1 Corinthians 5, it talks about church discipline. If there's a fornicator or a drunk or a railer, right? There's, there's certain sins. They're like, hey, if somebody's doing that in the church, kick them out. Deliver them unto Satan, yeah. right? Hey, hey the soul, will, the spirit's going to be saved. The flesh may die. It's called a sin unto death. But then you get into the next chapter in 2 uh, Corinthians 2. He talks about to forgive such a one, that they're not over much sorrow. Okay, so you get kicked out for being a drunk. You get it right. You come back. We forgive, we forget, like God. We don't always, well, you know, that one time, you remember when brother so-and-so, no, forget about it. God's forgiven them. If they're, if they're moving forward and they're not teaching that doctrine, then hey, you, you be thankful, you encourage them, you comfort them, right? That's why church discipline is in place. And this is what this is talking about in Hebrews 10, right? We come together, we grow together. If you have sin in your life that's so bad, you need to be kicked out, you'll come back. If you have sinned so bad in your life and nobody knows it and you don't get kicked out, you're being warned by the judgment of God, by the preaching, that God will correct you. Maybe things are going wrong at work and you can't figure it. Maybe it's that secret sin that nobody knows about. Right? This is why we come together in fellowship and doctrine. Look at verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye he shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Go back to Acts chapter 2. Hey, you were saved, you're sanctified, you're purified, and you take the blood of Christ, you take the covenant, you take that forgiveness, and you trod it underfoot. Think what he's saying here. Well, I know I'm saved. Going and getting drunk won't cause me to lose my salvation. Hey, amen. That's good news. But if you take that and you say, well, I'll just sin willfully and gr let grace abound. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. Guess what? God will judge that. Can you imagine taking the covenant? Can you imagine taking Jesus Christ, what he did for us? I don't care. I'm going to get drunk anyway. I don't care. I'm forgiven. Woe unto you. God will judge that. And people that don't hear preaching, they forget the word of God. People that don't see other Christians growing and getting better, they don't ever grow and get better. We're here to lift each other up and grow together to continue in the doctrine. Fellowship in the church and outside of the church is part of God's plan. Amen. It always has been. In Acts chapter 2, you know, the Bible says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. You want to be more wise? Walk with some wise people. Change your friends. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. There can be a wise man with the fools and be destroyed with the fools. But don't do that. That's what church is for. Look, go back to where we started. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We're almost done. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread is the next point. So I have a theory that this early church was a Baptist church. It says fellowship and breaking of bread, right? We're hanging out, hey, and we're eating together, right? All jokes aside, right? Jesus spent a lot of time with his disciples eating with them. With other people that want, hey, Lord, I want to talk to you. Hey, I'm coming to your house, right? I'm going to sit down and have a meal with you. I'm going to show you my doctrine by fellowshipping with you by breaking bread. We're going to talk over dinner. This is very common, and it happened a lot of time. Jesus did a lot even after he was resurrected. He broke bread with them. He gives us a pattern, and we ought to fellowship and hang out outside of church. There's no greater joy I have. I mean, I just heard it yesterday. Hey, where are you at? Oh, I'm on my way to Brother So-and-So's house. Cool. I don't get invited, you know? That's all right, you know? <laughs> Y'all are hanging out outside of the church, growing together, getting to know each other, encouraging each other, lifting each other up. That's the plan. That's what church is for. Look at verse number 46 here. Acts 2, 46. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They're hanging out from house to house. They're breaking bread from house to house. Now, obviously, the culture was a little bit different back then. 
right? You probably had to walk past your fellow Christian's house. It's like, hey, let's just have lunch together, right? The ladies that get together outside of the church, we, I mean, that's great. You guys need to do that. And sometimes in our generation, it's more of a text message. Yeah, we're fellowshipping from text to text, you know? That's good. That's profitable. That's fellowship, you know? And we ought to break bread, too. We ought to get together throughout the week. We ought to try to grow together. Hey, come on over to my house. Hey, let's go out for coffee. Hey, let's just sit down and spend some time outside of the church building, outside of the congregation, and just get to encourage each other and know each other and, and, and have compassion one for another so you can pray for each other. Look at verse 47. He says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Having favor with all the people. Can you imagine? Let's just imagine for a second, right? And I'm, I'm kind of off course here for a second. But imagine three houses in a row. This one's saved. This one goes, they go to church together and there's somebody that lives in the middle. And they're eyewitnessing these people coming closer together, hanging out together, having a, just being happy in life. Spending time together, breaking bread. They had favor with all the people. The other people didn't look and say, well, that bunch, they're a wild bunch. They said, wow, they really got something going on there. They got some true love. They're spending time with each other. And it says the Lord added to the church daily. And I believe that, you know, the more that we spend time together and the more that we try to, you know, compel others to come in, the more the Lord's going to add to the church. You know, and, you know, we often make fun of the visitation churches. There's no soul winning, right? The pastor doesn't even know how to give the gospel. But they're going to go visit the strangers, right? They're going to send a mailer. But, you know, we're, we're going to do some visitation in our church. And we've done some, and we're going to do some more. I go soul winning on Saturdays. Well, this Tuesday, my plan is to go back. I'm going to have my wife cook some, bake some cookies. And I'm going to go give a free gift New Testament to somebody. And I'm going to try to finish what I started on Saturday and compel them to come in. I'm like, hey, hey, I want to break bread with you. Hey, I want you to come to church. I want you to grow. And if you, you think about that, that's how we can have favor with all people. How are we going to change Jacksonville, Florida? Not by Christians moving here, but by us making Christians of those that are devout, but they're not really saved yet. Or maybe, maybe they're looking for somebody that's on fire. Maybe they want to know how to give the gospel, and it's like they're hitting a brick wall at their church. We're going to show them something different. We're going to do things differently here. Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. So fellowship in the church and fellowship outside of the church is a big part of God's plan. And it's good to break bread with one another. Hey, that's why there's crock pots back there. So we, hey, bring a crock pot. Sit down, enjoy some lunch with us. You don't have to just run off right away. We can sit down and learn each other and, and learn where our growth is at and encourage each other to grow. Here in Acts chapter 20, look at verse number seven. And upon the first day of the week, Again, why do we meet on Sundays? Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. That's some long preaching. Look, I've only been going for about an hour, but you know, I'm not going to preach all night, I promise. We'll be done in just a minute. But could you imagine, could you imagine hanging out in here and preaching all day long? That'd be wild. I mean, we experienced that at the, the Marching to Zion conference all these other churches and individuals that weren't even in church come together three four hundred people there and guess what it's like we knew each other yeah. we're in that same spirit soul winning in the morning let's do it we're telling war stories and we're talking about doctrine and opening our bibles and we're fellowshipping that's what it ought to be that's god's plan whereas the rest of it's like i'm going to step over you to get out the door first so i can beat you to the buffet like that's not christianity that's not how we should break bread you know and then sit it, sit it on other sides of the, of the buffet. He got the last of the bacon. I can't believe that guy. I'm telling pastor on him. You know, <laughs> Look, let's be real Christians. Look what he says in verse 8. Then there were many lights in the upper chamber, and they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft. It was taken up dead. Look, hey, when I'm long preaching and I see you sleeping, it's okay. All right, I'll just, hey, wake up. All right. I'll try to get you. I hope, I don't want you to fall over dead. That's why, that's why I get a little loud. Look at verse 10. And Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him and said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And when he would therefore come up again, he had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of day. So he departed. They broke bread twice. 
They broke bread, they preached, they broke bread. That's cool. That's the way it ought to be. Hey, go to 1 Timothy 2 and we'll be done. 1 Timothy chapter 2. So we need to remain, we need to be, continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Continue steadfastly in the apostles' fellowship. Continue steadfastly in the apostles' breaking of bread. But then the last one they say in Acts chapter 2 is continue steadfastly in prayers. It says prayers, plural. The Bible tells us we need to pray without ceasing and we need to pray for each other. These were devout men and women. In Luke chapter 2, it tells us of a devout woman. It says that she departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Do you know you can serve God by praying? Do you know that you can serve God by praying for other people in the church? You're doing God a service. You're working for Him by praying for other people, by praying for our needs. That's why we come together once a month, the men and the women separately, to have a time of prayer, to have a, a small time of fellowship, but really to pray for the needs of everybody else. Because we want God to answer our prayers, and He says He will. God works miracles, and He wants us to ask for His help. He wants us to trust Him for the answer. In Romans 1, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Can, you, can that be said of you? Is there somebody you make mention of always in your prayers? Write a name on the board. Pick somebody for the week. Write their name down. Put a reminder on your phone. Even when you're praying for dinner, oh, and Lord, help brother so-and-so. Lord, I just pray you would help them grow. I don't know what's going on, but you do, and I want to pray for them. Right? That's the type of Christians we ought to be. Colossians 4, he says, laboring fervently for you in prayers. That's not, you know, okay, done, we're good to go. No, laboring fervently in prayers, making it a goal, making it a mission, trying to help people by praying for them. He says that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Brother Marcel, my prayer for you is that you may stand complete in the will of God. That you would become a better preacher, a better Christian, a better dad, a better husband. And that's my prayer for all of you. I want to pray for everybody in here. And you ought to do the same thing. You need to just make a list and go through it. Right? If you, we have to force ourselves. Just do it. Just hey, say, I'm going to pick somebody this week. I'm going to pray for them that God's will would be worked in their life, that they would be a better Christian. And that will make you more perfect, make you more complete, make you a better Christian by doing those prayers. Yeah. In 1 Timothy 2, where you're at, Last verse here, verse number one. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. You could say these are the four types of prayer. There's also the fifth, the imprecatory prayer where David prayed against his enemies. Here we have supplications. Ask the Lord to supply your need. Ask for everything. Well, I get direct deposit. My check's coming no matter what. No, you need to ask the Lord to supply your need. You need to ask the Lord to provide for the power bill, for that you're, you, you can supply love, that you can be forgiving to your wife. He says prayers. We need to be praying. Pray without ceasing. Pray fervently. Intercessions. What does it mean to intercede on somebody's behalf? Lord, I see brother so-and-so struggling. Would you help him? Would you forgive him? Would you help him get stronger? Would you help them grow? Lord, I'm interceding for them. I'm praying on their behalf. And maybe the Lord will be merciful and long-suffering with your fellow brother or sister because you're interceding. He says, and giving of thanks be made for all men. I'm thankful for the people in this church. I'm thankful. Even when you say, well, I don't serve. I don't do the video. I don't do the ushering. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the single guys. Hey, even the ugly ones, right? I'm thankful for everybody in this church. We need to be thankful for each other. You know, it's encouraging to be uplifted and exhorted by one another. It's encouraging to hear the preaching at the men's preach tonight. The ladies are encouraged by the fellowship, by the text messages, by getting together. And so we need to be thankful for each other. Again, the Bible says pray without ceasing. He says you have not because you ask not. And there are certain things that we're warned about and this, this last bit is for the men in 1 Peter 3. He says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, listen, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Hey, men, 
You want to make sure your prayers are answered for your supplication, your needs, for your friends? Don't hinder your prayers by not giving honor to your wife, by not forgiving your wife. Man, you need to humble yourself and forgive your wife and love your wife, and God will hear your prayer. God will make sure he hears it. He, you won't be hindered. It is hindered if you're walking in the flesh and you've got a bad attitude towards your wife. Look, we've got to grow together. We want to be blessed together. He says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And that's how God is building this church. Let's continue steadfastly in doctrine, in fellowship, right? In breaking of bread and in prayers. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the book of Acts and all the great things that we see that happens with the New Testament church. Lord, I'm thankful for the ministry that we have here in Jacksonville, Florida. Lord, it seems like a wild west and how things are all new and yet they're old. Lord, where are all the old churches that are doing things wrong? Lord, I thank you for this new movement you're doing and this new church you've started. And Lord, help us to have a new spirit and a right spirit with you. Help us to be steadfast in our doctrine. Help us to obey what you've given us and love each other. Lord, I ask you would bless this church in our time of fellowship today and especially our time of soul winning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.